October 12, 1986, Anaheim, California. Game 5 of the American League Championship Series. The California Angels lead the series three games to one over the Boston Red Sox. The Angels are looking for their first World Series berth in their young franchise's history, while the Red Sox are still trying to break the curse of the Bambino, established nearly 70 years prior. The Angels take a 5-2 lead into the top of the ninth inning, with a 97% chance to win the game and take home the pennant. Red Sox first baseman Bill Buckner stepped up to the plate to try and start a rally and keep the Red Sox hope and season alive. Buckner leads off against Angel starter Mike Witt with a single, giving the Red Sox a glimmer of hope. Hall of Famer Jim Rice followed Buckner, but strikes out. The Angels are two outs away. Don Baylor follows Rice with a two-run blast, bringing the Red Sox within a run. Dwight Evans steps up after Baylor, but popped out to third base. The Angels are one out away from the World Series. Manager Gene Mock opts to go to the bullpen for the first time all game to get a lefty-on-lefty -lefty matchup bringing in Gary Lucas to face Rich Gedman. Lucas was brought in to face Gedman, and only Gedman, in the Angels' Game 4 win a day earlier, and struck him out. This time, the first pitch from Lucas hits Gedman, and suddenly the tying run is on first base. With right-handed hitting Dave Henderson coming to the plate, Mock goes to the bullpen again, bringing in closer Donnie Moore. Henderson was a mid-season acquisition by the Red Sox, and had been hitting under the Mendoza line since coming to Boston, and on top of that, was nursing a swollen knee. A couple innings prior, Henderson misplayed a fly ball, which resulted in a two-run home run to give the Angels a late lead. Moore, coming off an all-star appearance in 1985, was one of the game's best closers. The hard-throwing right-hander was known for his blazing fastball, as well as a signature splitter, to the sharp downward break that normally fell off the table and routinely fooled hitters. Moore began their battle with a fastball a little low, 1-0. He then attacks with another fastball that catches the corner, 1-1. He comes back with another fastball that Henderson swings right through, 1 and 2. The Angels are now one strike away from their first World Series appearance ever. Moore spikes a fastball into the dirt to even the count at 2. He breaks out his famous splitter for the first time this at bat, and Henderson chops it foul to stay alive. Angel Stadium is about to explode with excitement. Security is lined up along the fence to keep the fans from rushing the field. Another heater that Henderson barely gets a piece of, still knotted up at 2. Henderson steps out, takes a deep breath, and calls time to slow his heart rate down a bit. But what happened next would alter the histories of both franchises, as well as the lives of the three key players from that inning. The leadoff hitter, the pitcher, and the hero. Henderson will make everyone forget about his blunder earlier in Game 5, while leading to the vilification of the man who started the rally in the top of the ninth, as well as the suicide of the pitcher on the mound. Through the first part of Donnie Moore's career, he was an average reliever at best. Pitching for four teams over nine seasons, Moore posted a 419 ERA over 419 in the third career innings. But something clicked for Moore when he was acquired by the Angels in 1985. The former first-round draft pick posted a career-best 192 ERA over 103 innings, striking out 72 and saving 31 ball games. He was named to the 1985 American League All-Star team, pitching two perfect innings for the American League, and finished 7th in the Cy Young Award voting and 6th in the MVP voting. He was rewarded with a new $3 million contract he signed prior to the 1986 season. He continued to dominate, saving 21 games over 73 innings to help lead the Angels to the American League Championship. Moore had been battling shoulder issues later in the season, but pushed through the pain in order to perform for his team. He was that guy out of the Angels' bullpen in 1986. Manager Gene Mock went to Moore when he needed to get out of jams, and more times than not, Moore was able to come through for his team. Moore had been tasked with protecting a 4-1 Angels lead in Game 3 when he came in during the top of the 8th inning. The Red Sox would touch him up for a pair of runs in the 8th, but a scoreless ninth would give Moore's first and only career playoff save. Mock had hoped that Moore would be able to pick up a second save when he tasked him with getting Dave Henderson out in the top of the ninth inning of Game 5. Bill Buckner was nearing the end of his 22-year career during the 1986 season. He was an old, beat-up first baseman with bad legs and an aging body. He was known for his fantastic defensive play at first base, as well as one of the best pure contact hitters in the game. After spending seven and a half seasons with the Cubs in Chicago, where he was teammates with Donnie Moore, Buckner was traded to the Red Sox in 1984. When he stepped up to the plate to lead off the top of the ninth inning of Game 5, Buckner was hitting just .95 for the series and was 0 for 3 on the day. He knew that he needed to make something happen in order to keep the Red Sox hopes alive, and did just that. Buckner would hit a hard ground ball up the middle that would sneak past the infielders, and was shortly replaced by a pinch runner. That hit would be the spark the Red Sox needed in order to have a shot at winning this game and keeping their World Series hopes alive. After Baylor's home run and Gedman getting drilled, Dave Henderson came up to the plate and hit, at the time, the biggest home run in Red Sox history. To left field and deep and down he goes back and it's gone! Unbelievable!
The Angels would rally to tie the game in the bottom half of the ninth, but a Dave Henderson sack fly on the top of the 11th will put the Red Sox ahead for good and keep their season alive, at least for one more day. Games 6 and 7 will be back in Boston, which the Red Sox would win by a combined score of 18-5 to and advance to the World Series against the New York Mets. Of course, everyone knows what happened in that famous 1986 World Series. The Red Sox took a 3-2 series lead into Queens and held a 5-3 lead going into the bottom half of the 10th inning of Game 6, with Dave Henderson again belting the go-ahead home run. It had looked like the curse of the Bambino was about to be lifted. Red Sox pitcher Calvin Sherardi quickly got the first two outs of the bottom half, and then the most famous rally in New York Mets history happened. Three straight hits by Gary Carter, Kevin Mitchell, and Ray Knight pushed the Mets within one, and a wild pitch brought in the tying run. Then, Mookie Wilson hit a little dribbler towards Buckner at first base. Little roller up along first, behind the bag, it gets through Buckner, here comes Knight and the Mets win it! The Red Sox would lose Game 7, and Bill Buckner quickly became a villain in Boston. They shifted their focus from the curse of the Bambino onto Buckner, making him public enemy number one and the new scapegoat for the Red Sox failures to win a World Series. He was mercilessly booed and heckled at home in Boston, and was on the receiving end of numerous death threats about the air. The media crucified him, and were quick to remind the public who cost the Red Sox a chance at a World Series. He was a man who had a lengthy and very productive playing career completely forgotten about and was only remembered for a single play, while a single in Game 5 of the ALCS, which was the only reason the Red Sox were still playing, was completely forgotten about. One single moment in baseball history that would now define his career. It was something that no matter where he went, no matter what he did, when people recognized him or heard his name, his error was the first thing that came to mind. Buckner felt more betrayed by the media rather than the fans, once saying, I really had to forgive, not the fans of Boston per se, but I would have to say in my heart I had to forgive the media for what they put me and my family through. It took some time for Buckner, but he was able to poke fun at himself and embrace what he was remembered for, even making a memorable appearance on Curb Your Enthusiasm, in which he drops a signed baseball signed by Mookie Wilson, but later redeems himself by catching a baby from a burning building. He also threw out the first pitch of the 2008 Red Sox season, his first time back at Fenway since his playing career ended, and received a warm welcome from the Fenway faithful. While Buckner was able to forgive himself for his blunder eventually and sit back and laugh about it, another player from that 1986 ALCS was unable to. After Game 5, Donnie Moore acknowledged that he made a bad pitch, saying, I was throwing fastballs and Henderson was fouling them off, so I went with a split finger. Thought maybe I'd catch him off guard, but it was right in his swing. Maybe if I had tried to blow it past him, we'd be drinking champagne right now. When the Red Sox completed their comeback and won the series a few days later, Moore immediately took blame for the Game 5 loss. I'll shoulder the blame, he said. Somebody's gotta take the blame, so I'll take it. I threw that pitch, I lost that game. After that pitch in that series, Donnie Moore was never the same. His injuries were finally catching up to him, and he would only pitch 60 innings over the next two seasons for the Angels before being released. And that playoff loss never quite left his mind. He'd always blamed himself for letting his team down, and was unable to shake Henderson's home run from his memory. After his release from the Angels in 1988, he signed a minor league deal with the Kansas City Royals in 1989 in an attempt to make their major league club. By July, Moore had an ERA north of six, and the club felt it was time for a change. They informed Moore that they were releasing him, and Moore knew that his career was likely over. He was an older pitcher with pain in his shoulder, and was struggling to get minor league hitters out. The combination of his career ending, Henderson's home run in the back of his mind, as well as some personal demons were eating him up. Baseball is all that Moore had known, 
and his one chance at a World Series, in his eyes, was blown by a splitter that didn't break. The home run had been replayed and overanalyzed by Moore since it left his hand, and he could never quite let it go. Less than a week after being released by the Royals, Moore got into an argument with his wife. He went inside the house, grabbed a handgun, and shot his wife three times before turning the gun on himself. His wife, Tanya, would survive thanks to the couple's daughter driving her to the hospital shortly afterwards. Donnie Moore would not. He was 35. We'll never know the reason that Moore pulled the trigger and took his own life. He had a lot of personal demons that he was not able to overcome, and the ending of his playing career was hitting him hard. If Moore had gotten Henderson out, not only might he still be alive today, but he'd probably never even hear of his teammate, Bill Buckner. Dave Henderson had little confidence when he stepped up to the plate in the top of the ninth inning of Game 5 of the 1986 ALCS. I was in trouble, he said. I was just trying to survive. Henderson did more than that, and not only altered the course of baseball history, but numerous lives as well in the process. The ripple effect from his home run altered the lives of both Bill Buckner, who became a villain in Boston, and Donnie Moore, who became his own worst enemy. Buckner was able to laugh about his blunder and overcome his mistakes over time, while Moore was unable to get out of his own head and ended up costing him his own life. In life, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. While Buckner and Moore's were the most significant, Henderson indirectly impacted the lives of numerous Red Sox and Angels players, fans, and families with his go-ahead home run in Game 5 of the 1986 ALCS. It's a moment in baseball history filled with both joy and pain for all the players involved.